So Jim Dooley, you are the composer for a series of unfortunate events. Uh, you're a new addition to the second season of this uh, Netflix series. Can you talk about coming aboard and um, you know bringing your own sound to a show that's already had a, a full season and, and already has kind of a musical identity? Yeah, sure. You know, um, I got to tell you, just getting onto the show is a, a privilege. Working with uh, Barry Sonnenfeld has always been a treat from the time back doing Pushing Daisies, which now is 10 years ago. Um, when he first contacted me about it and I came to meet with him, um, we talked over, you know, what we really liked uh, in the season one and you know, what we thought, you know, might be able to push a little farther in season uh, season two. So that's um, um, where I began uh, musically. It really was like putting on a warm coat though. It's like there was so, this kind of dark fantasy world um, is really uh, something I feel very comfortable doing. What made it a challenge though is uh, how do I add my own sonic thing to, as you say, a show that's already had an existing score for a season. Um, the first thing I did was I started with brand new instruments that I'd never used before. Um, I rented a truckload of percussion instruments and sampled them all at my studio. Um, what I find that when you sit at a piano, it's not terribly easy to do something new with that instrument. Um, but if you start with, for example, um, like a, a stone marimba, which I created the instrument, uh, no one's ever done anything with it because it never existed in the way that I had it. So everything that you do with it then is new. Um, and that's where I began. But the easiest way to add new color to this show was um, the each book in the series allows you to reinvent the skin of the show. Um, so when we go to the vile village, you know, that was my Morricone take. Then, you know, when we get to uh, Heimlich Hospital, uh, then that's my take on a thriller. Um, you know, and none of the composers had to tackle those as being genre specific um, in season one. So I didn't have to really be too um, beholden to any existing uh, style um, from season one. Mm -hmm. Something I wanted to ask uh, that seemed very interesting that you just said, um, using instruments you'd never used before. Um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about the kind of, um, I guess, trial and error or, or learning curve of, of that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's always a, a risk when you're making new instruments. You never know really what's going to work well. Um, like, I'll give you an example of a, a, an instrument that worked out well and then one that did not. Um, one of the more successful ones were like, oh, there were two. One was the bass flapamba, which if you can imagine, it looks like a marimba with um, a, a reverberation box underneath it that's about the size of a room. Um, and then there was uh, the stone marimba, which each piece was a piece of slate. And so each note is unique there. It's, it, it's not commercially duplicated. Uh, and everything had its own little character to it. Those were very successful. Um, one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to have some really new, uh, cool bass sounds for the show. So I rented one of the giant, uh, it's called a guitaron, the mariachi bass. And I play, I was ruining my fingers for days playing this thing. Uh, it's really difficult. Uh, and then none of it ended up sounding right for the show, even though we'd spent days working on the instrument. But one sample came out of it, which was the bass guitar on the guitar on string harmonics were the only thing that actually ended up in the show is one of the last things we recorded on the instrument, but became uh, something quite useful. Mm -hmm. So uh, you kind of uh, touched on this a little bit, but uh, I wonder if you could drill down on this a bit more about what exactly is the musical identity of this show? Sure. You know, um, as, as opposed to something you know, like I was talking about Pushing Daisies before, which at its heart is a romance. Mm -hmm. um, this show uh, is really um, where these kids are trying to find identity in a world that is stacked against them. The, there aren't a lot of hopeful themes in the show. The majority of the music, the character of the music is all set against the Baudelaire's. Um, the villains have the upper hand most of the time. Um, so. You really don't get into many 
situations where you're cheering somebody on, it's you're praying for something to go well for them when you just know it's only going to get worse. So a lot of the thematic material and the instrumentation um, is to uh, make you feel that things are, are really wrong and that the, the, the odds are stacked against our, who we want to be heroic. Um, and that uh, really led to me to one of the first themes that I had to write for um, for the show. Um, when I was here, I'll play some of it for oh, you. Sure, yeah. Um, the first thing I sat down when I was talking with Barry, I said, you know what I really wanted when it, whenever Lemony Snicket's is underground and in the tunnels, the first episode that I saw was um, the Airsats Elevator part one and two. So whenever he's underground, I said, you really want to give something that uh, this kind of journey to the center of the earth, um, just the ab, and when Bernard Herrmann did that, he did it without strings. It was supposed to be the absence of hope, the mm -hmm. absence of the warmth of the sun. And I wanted to give that to the show. So the, one of the first themes I wrote was this. Oh, sorry, let me put it on a piano. <laughs> um, here. And so you'll hear that in different iterations when uh, it's really the, the world is unraveling against uh, our kids. Um, there's really only two themes that end up being hopeful in the series. One is when the kids are thinking about their parents, which became... That's supposed to be this kind of very reminiscent of, of their parents kind of putting on an old record, little waltz um, that they would listen to at home. Um, but the, it's really few and far between. So it's obviously there's mystery, there's caper, but primarily it's uh, creating a world um, of very little hope. I wonder, I wonder you, you arrive at what you just played, played for, for us. What is your process, process like? like? You know, yeah, I mean, how do you how get, do you get started? started? Sure, you know, um, the, the first thing I did is I, I did sit at the piano and just to write some of the thematic material. Um, I'll give you an example of um, a, a very real life example of uh, a theme that I wrote, which actually didn't end up getting used as much in the series um, as I would like, but it is in there. Uh, one of my favorite themes uh, is uh, John Williams from E.T., which is the... <laughs> This theme is designed to feel that, again, hope is disappearing. All of the harmonic movement constantly descending. And the, the theme, it's never, it never quite reaches where it wants. You always get this feeling that hope is going away. So I wanted to write a theme for again, the absence of hope. And so I, I was playing through the John Williams and then I wrote a theme which became. Um, but I was using a, a couple of chord changes like from that ET thing to try to, okay, where do I start from where to write for something that's an absence of hope? And we're at the slipping melodic movement and the harmonic movement that's how i uh, started messing around and came up with that uh, that specific theme very 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 good, good idea. Idea. I have musical <laughs> <accompaniment>. um, <laughs> uh, can you talk a bit more about working with uh, barry sonnefeld with the collaborations yeah sure you know what um the best things that you create usually happen after you do something that's poor um and i mean that uh, this is something that uh, a valuable lesson from J.K. Rowling did a, a commencement address at Harvard, which she entitled The Fringe Benefits of Failure. Um, and she was talking about how failure really allows you to strip away the things that are unimportant um, and the benefits of failure. And, you know, in a lot of the tech companies now you hear fail faster. They want you to make the mistake, but they want you to learn from it quicker. Um, you need a collaborator who's willing 
to have you stretch and make mistakes so that you can get to the good stuff sometimes. It's, um, if you don't have a collaborator you trust, like Barry, I've, I've known him for a long time. We, we, he knows we're gonna get there. Um, I mean, you can, make, you can take some chances that allow you to be really creative where um, if you had to be fearful about these creations, you'd never do them. So for example, um, we, we wanted to do some, you know, crazy kind of instrumentation things. I'm like, okay, let's do carnivorous carnival with lots of attitude circus instruments and a swing band. And you're like, you don't know if it's going to work, but you have somebody on your side who's going to believe in you. Um, so that's how carnivorous carnival begins with a swing band that goes into carnival music. It's, um, uh, that's the best part is that he's super creative. He's willing to listen and, um, best idea wins. Now you are an Emmy winner for uh, another show that you two did together, Pushing Daisies. Uh, talk a bit about uh, that night and what that recognition meant for you. You know, it, that was, uh, for as far as my life has gone, it's one of the more bizarre nights um, of my life. Uh, I, I can't say enough about what that was like, but the first, the immediate part was that um, it was this incredible sense of relief. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, oh God, I don't have to spend tomorrow going, yeah, everybody's saying, well, it was nice to be nominated. It's like, <laughs> actually, it was really nice to win. Um, but I, I never, I just, I never imagined I would because uh, the other, con, you know, category, in the category that year was Simpsons, Family Guy, Lost. You know, I was like, House. It was just all these super popular shows. So, um, but uh, I was really glad, you know, we had some more people on, on Pushing Daisies one. Obviously, Stuart Bass uh, won for editorial, and he's on a series of unfortunate events as well. So it's really nice to have uh, the team the team back. And Barry won as well. I mean, on a different night, but... Uh, That's yeah. true, yes. It's like the three of us back together again. Um, it's, again, it's been a wonderful, it's a wonderful ride with uh, working with these people over the 10 years. And are you coming back for season three? That's funny, actually. It's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> I would say I, my career is on a slippery slope, but that's just the name of the episode I'm doing. <laughs> uh, well, Jim Dooley, thank you so much, and uh, congratulations on your work. It was a pleasure talking with you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good one.